Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the front row. Uh, my name is Jamie Williamson, and I'm the executive vice president here at Scripps Research. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here. We have an international crowd. Uh, I, I know at least we've got one person who's uh, logging in from Portugal. And uh, so it's, uh, it's really great to have everybody back and uh, to, to hear the talk by Professor Sumit Chanda. Uh, so so um, before we do that, I'd like, to, um, I'd like to say a few things and maybe in general about, about what's going on here at Scripps Research. Uh, so, so we're a biomedical research institute. We're one of the largest in the country. And, and we focus in five specific areas, which are the academic departments that we have here uh, listed. We have chemistry, immunology, and microbiology, structural biology, molecular medicine, and neurosciences. So those represent the spectrum of chemical and biological research that goes on here at Scripps. But one of the things that we pride ourselves on is the fact that it's an interdisciplinary uh, 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 program. So there are a few silos or barriers for, for people to collaborate with across these disciplines. And, and so I, I'll give a couple of really quick examples uh, of that. Uh, here, and we have uh, some really interesting vaccine work that was carried out as a collaboration between Professor Ian Wilson, who's the chair of the structural biology department, uh, and Dennis Burton, who's the, the chair of the immunology department. And they uh, looked at how we could attack the coronaviruses by looking at the vulnerable sites on the spike protein that, that uh, can be attacked by antibodies and to try to develop improved vaccines on that. Uh, they've had a long-standing collaboration and we were well positioned to, uh, to take this challenge on here at Scripps in this interdisciplinary work. Another example of uh, collaboration is between a neuroscientist and uh, one of our professors in molecular medicine. So Holly Klein is chair of neuroscience, and, uh, and she teamed up with John Yates, who is an expert at mass spectrometry, and they tagged and identified proteins that were uh, communicating bet between synapses, and, and this is really a, a key advance in understanding a variety of neurological conditions, in, including some of these neurodegenerative diseases or uh, autism. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, uh, I, I just like to, to say that, uh, you know, we train young scientists to go off into the world. We have an outstanding graduate program. And, and I said there were no silos of, between our departments. And this is just a really nice quote. For, uh, don't, don't listen to me, but listen to one of our alumni. So Rigo says, Scripps is a place with no barriers. You have departments, but a, everybody is doing three or four different fields. Everybody's trying to answer a complex question from a different perspective. So you, this is one of our trainees who's now off at a, a major biotechnology firm. Uh, and we're really proud of our students. So let's uh, come back to uh, Sumit. So Sumit is uh, uh, clearly an expert in uh, virology and antiviral therapies. We were fortunate to recruit Sumit over from uh, the local Sanford Burnham uh, Priebus Institute it, just in the past year. So he's well known to us, but uh, is a relatively recent arrival at Scripps. So welcome, Sumit, and we're really pleased to have you here. Uh, I think uh, what Sumit is going to talk about is, uh, is it, it's, it's a, a bit timely. I mean, we're not really out of the pandemic yet. Uh, it's still, things have calmed down a lot. We're, we're kind of back to semi-normal here at Scripps in terms of a working environment. Uh, but, you know, we had a lengthy series of COVID-related seminars. Hopefully, many of you could see them uh, in the past year. But Sumit's going to uh, revisit this. And I, I think he's going to do an early, uh, or, sorry, an overview of some of the early efforts. You know, we just found out there was a coronavirus. What happened? What was the immediate response? And then I think he's going to kind of give us an overview of where we are uh, in, in terms of vaccines and what, what the future might hold for, for that uh, and what's, what's the coming year going to look like. So it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Sumit Chanda. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity. And I think that uh, it's never been more important for scientists to be able to share 
their research with the public. And so uh, what I'm gonna do today is um, in two parts. So I call a little bit of an audible. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we did in the lab during quarantine. So the first one of my talk is gonna be entitled Building the Plane While Flying, Research in the Time of COVID. And then I'm gonna to go to um, probably the, the uh, try to address many of the questions that you might have uh, of, of how, how this pandemic ends and what we really need to do to be better prepared uh, for the next pandemic. So uh, our lab and our response to the, um, the pandemic uh, really uh, was in two different camps. One was trying to uh, use our basic research capabilities to understand the virus and then also to build novel antiviral therapies. And I just kind of want to get through go through um, some of the, the more important uh, contributions the folks in the lab made. And then I'll jump into a story uh, about um, our, our trek through developing uh, antivirals with the folks uh, at Scripps Caliber. So one of the uh, stories that we, uh, one of the findings that we worked on with Jeff Esco at, at UCSD was to, to understand how SARS-CoV-2 actually uh, enters the human uh, cell. Uh, we discovered how SARS-CoV-2 is detected by the immune system and uh, trigger not only antiviral responses, but uh, potentially uh, some of the more severe disease phenotypes that are associated with hospitalization. Uh, Laura Martin Sancho in the lab uh, had a, a beautiful study on how, SARS, uh, how our cells defend against SARS-CoV-2 and working with Yvonne Marazzi at Mount Sinai, we were looking at uh, potential treatments for uh, 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 severe disease uh, caused by SARS-CoV-2. I think one of the things I'm most proudest of is work that was done by Ann Beal, who you see here. Um, we teamed up with Lilly uh, to put together the uh, uh, FDA approval application for Bamlanivab which was the first antibody approved in November, two, uh, 2000, November 9th, 2020 for the treatment of COVID. Uh, it's just since been withdrawn and supplanted by, by another antibody that is more effective against Omicron. But really, I think the work that Anne did and others in the lab helped, uh, helped save lives uh, in, in collaboration with Lily. So I'm gonna take you back to how all of this started. And so if you can remember back to December, 2019, I know it seems like a lifetime ago for most people. Uh, Xin Yin, who is a postdoc in the lab, uh, went home to China for the Christmas holidays. Um, and uh, he, he contacted me, he said, uh, hey Sumit, um, you know, there's, there's a outbreak of pneumonia in the Ube province in China of unknown etiology. And I said, okay, well, keep me posted. You know, hopefully it's just some sort of bacterial uh, uh, thing that's going around that they just can't isolate. And then I got a two word text from him uh, and it was novel coronavirus. Now, if you're a virologist and if you heard, hear the words novel coronavirus or novel influenza virus to get, uh, together, uh, you go right straight into war footing. Uh, these are things that we all know have pandemic potential and potential catastrophic uh, outcomes on global health. So what we did was in, in mid-January 2020, uh, we assembled a team, what I call the dream team of virologists. Uh, we were able to collaborate with uh, Ren Sun at UCLA, Cho Fang Yang and uh, Kwok Young Yoon, who uh, are at Hong Kong University. So you have to remember at this time, the virus was only in China and uh, we couldn't get it out. So we had to work with the team in China. Uh, KY was actually the discoverer, one of the discoverers of the first SARS. So he had a lot of expertise. And, and a friend, a longtime collaborator, and an eminent virologist, Adolfo Garcia Sastra at Mount Sinai. In parallel, uh, what we did was teamed up with Arnab Chatterjee at Scripps Caliber uh, to provide a, a drug library. So a library that we can look for potential antiviral. The strategy that we took was uh, using a library, what's called as a re known as a repurposing library. So these are libraries of known drugs um, that have already been in humans. And so drug discovery and developing a new drug can take uh, years, if not up to a decade. Of course, in a pandemic, you don't have that kind of time. And so the idea was to take drugs that we already understood the safety profile of test them against SARS-CoV-2 and see if we could quickly move things uh, into patients without extended development time and clinical trials. So the plan was 
to send Laura Riva, who is a postdoc in the lab, but who now works at Caliber, over to Hong Kong uh, with this library and with, with, uh, with robots from our lab and work with KY and his team and, uh, and go through these 12,000 molecules and find those ones that we might be able to use for SARS-CoV-2. In early February, there was a travel ban, so Laura could leave, but he wouldn't, she wouldn't be able to get back in. So we didn't think it was worth the risk of her going to Hong Kong. So um, we came up with a plan B, um, and that was what we call drug discovery by iPhone. Okay, And so uh, what we did was we packed up everything that Laura was going to uh, take with her into boxes, this included, includes the, the robots, the, the, the libraries, uh, a number of reagents. Of course, shipping uh, during a during a pandemic is not as straightforward as 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 shipping during normal times, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when this was raging in 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 China. Our box uh, ended up in Guangzhou instead of Hong Kong. Uh, Paul De Asus, who's pictured in the top right here, uh, was was on the phone with FedEx almost 24 hours trying to make sure we could reroute that uh, to the proper place. And hats off to both Paul and and FedEx. All our packages arrived and FedEx refilled dry ice and kept everything uh, at the temperature it needed to be. And here you can see some of our automation being placed in their BSL-3 facility. This is the highly protective uh, place that you do work with uh, very dangerous viruses. And so um, after that happened, Laura uh, downloaded uh, uh, WeChat, which is a Chinese version of WhatsApp and essentially stayed up in the middle of the night. And uh, those folks in Hong Kong had a, had a burner iPhone in their BSL-3 facility because you could only take things in and not bring them out and would be essentially directing them how to do this uh, screen uh, by iPhone, okay? And then she would come in to work during the day too. So you could imagine um, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, effort she put in. And uh, I'm, I'm really not doing their heroics justice. And so if you're more interested in kind of learning about what this team did, uh, Kim Tingley of the New York Times Magazine put, put together a really nice piece on, on, on these, these uh, this, this uh, I think only can be described as, as heroic efforts by Lara Paulson and, and SF and the team. So the, the library, I wanna talk a little bit about um, where we're, we're using these known drugs uh, was developed by Caliber, which is a, a, the drug discovery arm of, of, of Scripps. Uh, it's known as, uh, it's called Reframe. And so it has 12,000 different drugs, known drugs that are known to be safe in human and have well-characterized therapeutic properties, okay? And it was developed before the pandemic, right? So 2018 with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates, Foundation, but it was really the, the, the right asset at the right time uh, for, for this pandemic. And so uh, what they did, Lara and the group in, in, in Hong Kong did was screen through all of these 12,000 to find uh, a number of drugs. And this was the first map that we made because they found 300 drugs that seemed to work to knock down SARS-CoV-2 infection in a lab cell line, okay? And so this was great. There was something in there, but uh, obviously uh, working on 300 drugs wasn't going to get us to something that we could put into the people. So um, in, in, in parallel, what we started to do was get the virus here in San Diego. And, and this is a picture of Laura Martin Sancho uh, getting the virus. I believe it's the first place in San Diego County um, that, uh, that received the virus. And she was able to take a very small sample of that virus, figure out how to grow it. So, you know, you have to imagine that uh, we didn't know much about this virus and she really uh, was able to pull a rabbit out of the hat and, 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 and amplify the virus so we can use it and do our own characterization and also develop an assay we could directly assess how well the virus grows. And, and, and uh, in, in the bottom right corner here, you can see what she did so the blue cells, uh, the blue dots are cells that are not infected by SARS-CoV-2. And the green are cells that are infected with SARS-CoV-2. And, and, and so this gave us a real nice, easy, simple way to quantify the replication of this virus and quantify how well the drugs work. And so we developed what, what we call a testing funnel. So that allows us to get from 300, these 300 that came out of the initial assessment down to uh, a handful of molecules that we could 
uh, assess in, in more, more depth, okay, and more rigor. Ultimately, the goal was to move into uh, an animal model uh, to show efficacy. And if, if we're able to do that, uh, move things uh, into clinical trials in humans. And, and, and again, because we're screening libraries of compounds that are known to be safe in humans and, 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 and have uh, defined therapeutic properties, uh, the, the, the idea was that the, this process uh, could be compacted from, you know, you typically, you know, five to 10 years down to uh, months, if not a, a year. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at was, okay, well, this, uh, these molecules, these 300 molecules can block uh, the virus in a dish, but can they uh, potentially work in people? Can we get enough of the drug into people to have that antiviral efficacy that we see in the lab. And I'm not gonna kind of get into this too much, but uh, what we did was do what's called a dose response curve. So it's just adding dilutions of the drug. And, and you can see here that this is an example, the more drug you add, the less uh, viral replication you get. And as you back off the drug, uh, the virus uh, tends to replicate better. Uh, we also did what's called a toxicity control because you know, killing cells will also block viral replication. So like adding bleach to cells would, you know, give us the same curve, but also, uh, and I think most of us can agree that bleach is not a good antiviral. So anything that kills the cells, we could kind of move to the side. So based on that analysis, we found 21 drugs, um, known drugs that were able to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 replication at concentrations that we think we could achieve in patients. And so one of these drugs um, was remdesivir, uh, and this was then uh, already being studied by Gilead and others as uh, uh, um, a, a very potent uh, antiviral against SARS-CoV-2 and went on to be the first uh, small molecule that was approved uh, for uh, treatment of SARS-CoV-2. And so this testing funnel, so our next testing funnel, I mentioned we used a lab-based cell line, which is kind of a workhorse cell line that allowed us to get through all of these thousands and thousands of compounds, but uh, they weren't really uh, what we call primary cells. So, so cells that could be found in the body, but, uh, and so what we did was we turned to stem cells. So iPS stem cells, our stem cells are cells that can really be driven to turn into pretty much any cell in the body. And so what we did was we worked with collaborators to take these stem cells and turn them into pneumocytes. And pneumocytes are cells in the lungs that are the primary uh, um, uh, 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 cells that are the target of replication of SARS-CoV-2. So we asked the question, okay, um, we can block replication in these, in these lab cell lines. Can we do it in cells? that are more reflective of what's going on in disease. And, and what you can see here is uh, DMSO is, is essentially a negative control, so adding nothing. Um, and then uh, we are not, we were benchmarking to remdesivir. By that time, remdesivir was kind of the, the, the front runner um, that was uh, um, being uh, developed by Gilead. But what you can see here is that the molecules that we found uh, do almost as well, but not as well as remdesivir, but still showing some level of activity in these more relevant uh, cell lines, cell types. Okay, and I think the, uh, the 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 final thing that we could do without actually going into animals is lung tissues, right? So these are biopsies from human lungs. Uh, now, obviously, the lung is the primary source a site of replication for SARS-CoV-2 and, 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 and uh, the, the site that drives most of the, the uh, disease in, in, in uh, acute infection. And we asked the question, can these drugs also uh, block replication in, in lung tissue? And so we took these lung tissue, added SARS-CoV-2 along with the drugs, you could see that, that uh, some, not all, some, I'm showing you the ones that work here, um, do, did as well as, um, if not better than uh, remdesivir, depending on uh, the approach you use to measure it. So we had a, a set of a final candidates, about four or five, that we said, okay, well, these all look good. Um, let's start moving into, um, into an animal model, which is obviously more complex than doing things kind of in a dish outside of the lab. 
And we focused on a molecule called clofazamine. And so uh, it actually wasn't the best molecule that came out. Uh, it still kind of went through all of the filters, but uh, the reason we did uh, was a couple of reasons. One, uh, it was discovered a long time ago. Um, it's, it's an FDA approved drug uh, and, there, and it's on the WHO's list of essential medicines, okay? So there's a long track record of using it and what the potential safety profiles are and so on. And so it's used for the treatment of leprosy and some people use it for, for, for treating tuberculosis. Uh, the other point is that, uh, you know, this, this, this is a cheap drug. It's a cheap drug and it's a pill, right? So the reason those two things are important is that we know that giving antivirals early um, is absolutely necessary. So it's much easier to give a pill to somebody uh, instead of having them come into the hospital and get an IV infusion of remdesivir. The second thing is cost, right? So, you know, in, in, in the Western world, um, our insurance can cover a $3,000 uh, remdesivir treatment, but in the in, in in developing countries, this is not really something that can be made widely available. And 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 we all know that you know none of us are protected until all of us are protected, right? So the the need to develop a a a cheap and an orally uh, bioavailable uh, antiviral, I think, was uh, was uh, foremost in our mind. So what we did was we did two studies, okay? One was a prophylaxis study and the second is a therapeutic study. So uh, this was in hamsters. So hamsters um, uh, uh, are one of the, the, the uh, chosen models for SARS-CoV-2 um, really are able to recapitulate human disease um, uh, in, in, in a way that uh, at that time, you know, a mouse model could not. So the prophylactic uh, is, 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 is giving the drug before challenge with the virus. And the therapeutic is more uh, real life scenario where you give the drug after uh, you get sick. And so these are the days uh, we were either gave clofazamine three days before viral challenge or uh, day two and three after viral challenge. And then we looked at uh, various uh, markers for viral replication and disease. And so uh, the take home message was that the Administration of clofazamine resulted in a tenfold lower virus titer in the lungs and was very comparable, not as good, but close to that of remdesivir, which was um, at the time uh, the uh, frontline treatment. The other important thing is that uh, it decreased uh, the uh, what are called levels of cytokines. Cytokines are actually a measurement of the inflammatory response. And so that inflammation, that immune response really is what causes severe disease, hospitalization and death, right? It's your, it's your body really overreacting to the virus. And so we found that clofazamine can temp temper these. Um, and so, you know, we had this molecule now that uh, we, we think um, can both lower uh, the uh, virus in the body as well as uh, start uh, tamping down on those, those negative responses that lead to severe infection. And I know uh, most of you don't know how to read histology slides, so, uh, but I thought this was a nice uh, illustration of uh, what clofazamine does uh, in the lungs. These are hamster lungs. And so um, I can point you uh, really easy uh, to, to orient you. Um, to vehicle is uh, essentially um, what happens uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infection without any sort of intervention. Uh, you give clofazamine and then mock infection is what a normal healthy lungs look like. And so I think the, the one I wanna point out to you that's probably most stark is the alveolar destruction. So alveoli are the air sacs in your lungs. I think most of you know this. Um, and, and you can see here that in, in, in the healthy mouse, there's nice healthy pockets here. The clofazamine treated mouse. Um, also, the, the, there are nice healthy pack, packet, uh, pockets. But uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 infected mouse, you can see essentially the destruction, the collapse of these alveoli, um, really that, that contribute to uh, the, the dysfunction in the lungs and, and severe disease. So you can see that uh, clofazamine really is protecting against this and, and uh, 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 lets you get to a point where your, your lungs uh, are healthy or healthier than uh, what, uh, what, uh, what happens after, after infection. So I'm gonna skip that. And, and so the other interesting thing we noticed about clofazamine was that the combination of low-dose clofazamine and low-dose remdesivir 
works better than high dose remdesivir alone. Um, and, and so this is important because then you could do combinatorial treatments, right? So for, for a number of different reasons that I'll get into in a minute, but the, one of the most important things is that then you can cut the cost of remdesivir, right? Instead of uh, having that $3,000 uh, uh, treatment course dose, you can scale back on the amount of remdesivir you use and have it go further. Uh, the other interesting thing was we found that the combo blocked viral replication in the nose, which we didn't see with remdesivir alone. And so the nose is really the site of, of transmission or one of, the, one of the sites of transmission. And if we could block it in the nose, we could not only help the patient, but we could also help the patient uh, from spreading virus. So why are we doing this now? There are current, uh, why are continuing to do this? There are current uh, antiviral therapies that work, uh, especially for Omicron. And I'll, I'll go through some of these with you. So as I mentioned, remdesivir, uh, it's approved, uh, but it's given intravenously. So you have to go to a, a medical facility uh, to get it. And, and, and again, uh, antivirals work best when given early and preferably within the first 72 hours of onset of symptoms. And so getting people uh, remdesivir on boarded in a, in, a, in a timely manner is a challenge. And especially if you don't have the medical infrastructure to, uh, to, to be able to deliver it. So two new drugs that are under EUA or emergency use authorization that I think are, are game changers. Uh, these are pills, okay? Uh, so, so they can be orally administered, you test positive, you call your doctor and you get pr prescribed something at CVS and that same day uh, you can be onboarding. So uh, uh, molnupiravir uh, is a drug out of Merck uh, that showed uh, good but not great clinical efficacy and uh, Paxlovid, which is a, a protease inhibitor out of Pfizer, really just did amazingly in the clinic, a 90% effective uh, rate. And so, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, any of my family uh, that was susceptible to severe disease um, got, uh, 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 got, got SARS-CoV-2, uh, this is the drug, at least I would be uh, uh, recommending that they, they onboard first. Um, then there's a series of antibodies. Um, and so there's, there's two flavors of antibodies that work against SARS-CoV-2. And I, as I mentioned uh, before, the antibody that we worked on um, was uh, uh, the, the EOA was revoked because it didn't work on Omicron, but Lilly came out with another antibody uh, that did work on Omicron. Uh, GSK and a, a biotech company in the Bay Area called Vair has an approved antibody. Um, and, and these are for treatment. Uh, and again, they're delivered intravenously. So uh, you really need to get in and get these antibodies um, uh, very quickly after, after symptoms if you're uh, at risk for a, a severe outcome. The last antibody from AstraZeneca is actually meant to be a prophylactic antibody. So if uh, you're immunosuppressed or for some reason you don't think that, that you responded to the vaccine, uh, I would highly recommend talking to your doctor and seeing if you can onboard this. It's a long acting antibody that essentially gives you protection over a period of months to SARS-CoV-2 and, and especially important for those that, that, that really are, are at high risk and, um, and may not ha have been able to gain all of the advantages of, uh, of, of the, the, the vaccines that are out there. And so uh, where do we go next? And, and so, you know, these, these therapies are great, uh, but, uh, you know, the problem is, is that uh, every time we've tried to throw a single drug at a virus, the virus finds a way around it. The virus becomes resistant, okay? And so there are lessons to be learned from how we've developed highly effective treatments for HIV and hepatitis C. And this is a combinatorial strategy, right? So heart, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy, which essentially converted HIV from a death sentence to a chronic manageable disease, consists of three or more drug combinations, right? Uh, the cure, this is a cure for HCV, hepatitis C, consists of two or more drug combinations. So this is how you corner the virus into not being able to mute, mutate away from any one drug. And so this is why we're, keep, we, we're continuing to push on clofazamine because we think that we need multiple uh, shots on net here and then combine them to be able to keep the virus at bay. So uh, our next steps right now 
is that uh, we're raising, we're trying to raise funds for clinical trials. Uh, one is slated uh, out of Spain in, in Barcelona, and uh, the other is out of, uh, going to be in, in uh, Brazil uh, with the uh, Together uh, Clinical uh, Trial Consortium. And, uh, you know, hopefully if, if we are able to secure the funds to move forward on this, uh, hope to have some, some uh, uh, good news about uh, clofazamine in uh, the, the next uh, six to eight months. And, and, and hopefully uh, a, a combinatorial strategy between clofazamine and some of the other drugs I mentioned to really help us uh, get past um, this uh, uh, the therapeutic uh, uh, challenge of uh, resistance. So uh, that's the end of uh, kind of uh, our quarantine, what, I, what we did during quarantine. I really uh, wanted to acknowledge um, the folks that uh, really uh, were my uh, family away from my family during my quarantine. Uh, Laura Riva, Laura Martin Sancho, Xin Yin, Yan Pu, and Sylvie Bondel, who kept us all safe. Um, and I, I put their nationalities up um, for, for two reasons. Um, so one, is, is to underscore the fact that while they were working during this time, so you remember this was very early in the pandemic, um, the virus hadn't really reached the US yet, but it was raging in China and Italy and in Spain and in France where all of the, their families were, okay? And so these folks really, you know, they were, they were, they were working with the, with the virus that we've never seen before in the lab and then also worrying about their families at home uh, while, uh, while, while this, this virus was, was spreading uh, really in an unmitigated fashion. Um, the second point I wanna make on this is that all of these folks uh, did not, uh, they came from, from other countries. And American science is the best in the world because we recruit the best people in the world. And so uh, the reliance on us being able to keep our, our leadership is really going to depend on us being able to continue to recruit uh, the best in the world to do uh, these, these kinds of activities that we need to do to keep us all safe uh, from pandemics, but in, 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 in global health in general. So I'm gonna switch gears now. Uh, I know there's gonna be a Q and A session after this, but I'm gonna switch gears to um, the, uh, the, the FAQ page and I'll try to go through this quickly. So you do have some time to ask questions. Um, so I know most of you probably got the mRNA vaccine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how mRNA vaccines work and why we need boosters and then uh, go from there. So if you remember back to your basic biology course, um, DNA in our cells gets transcribed to RNA, which transcribes to protein. Um, and in very few cases, unless you're HIV or retrovirus, can you reverse this path? And so what the RNA technology does is really hijack this process and, and, and introduce an RNA and make it into a protein. And so what the uh, RNA vaccine manufacturers did, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, was take a snippet out of the coronavirus genome that codes for spike. And most of you know spike is, is, is uh, the, um, essentially the key that unlocks uh, the entry of the virus into human cells. It binds to a receptor called ACE2 uh, that allows it to enter human cells, but it's also the piece of the virus that is exposed to the immune system, right? So this was uh, kind of an obvious candidate to design a vaccine around. And so what the mRNA technology does was really take that mRNA that encodes for spike, uh, put it in a lipid nanoparticle, and when that's injected, that lipid nanoparticle uh, fuses with your cells, and then your cells think it's an, it's an RNA that, that it's making, makes that spike protein. And that spike protein triggers uh, an immune response, and I won't get into the nitty gritty of it, but dendritic cells, which are a white blood cell type, take up uh, dying cells, um, and they, they activate what are called T helper cells to say, hey, there's something, there's something here that shouldn't be here. Uh, T cells then go to the B cells, which are the antibody factories of the body, um, and say, okay, well, you have an antibody uh, for, uh, against this spike protein, start making the antibody. So there's, there's a couple of checks there, but, but uh, eventually you get this production of antibody that essentially gums up the spike protein and doesn't allow it to bind to ACE2 and enter the cells. Okay, that's great. Uh, but so the, the downside of this is that, you know, these antibodies aren't forever. And, and what you can see here in the light blue is that, you know, when you get a vaccine or you get an infection, you get a peak 
and it starts to wane, right? This is what you hear about, about you know, waning antibody protection. So fortunately, there's additional layers of protection known as memory B cells and T cells. Uh, but right now, as far as we understand, this, this, this kind of level of, of IgG antibody is the best correlate of, of protection. Um, uh, there could be others going forward, but uh, if you have high levels of these, these antibodies, you're uh, uh, much less likely to end up in the hospital. So the other thing that we're contending with is that the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines were made to the ancestral strain of the virus, which came out of Wuhan, right? So the Omicron, as you know, or may know, has 32 mutations in it that are different, that makes it different from the original strain, okay? So why does this matter? So this is just a cartoon. So when your antibodies bind spike, they bind to specific regions of the spike protein, which is shown in, in gray, and they gum up the, the ability of spike to bind ACE2 and, and turn the keyhole and enter the cell. When the virus mutates, uh, what it does is it sheds the, 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 sheds off these antibodies, okay? And so these antibodies can no longer bind because they're, they're actually uh, different, uh, different, different uh, 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 sites of protein uh, that, that, that it can no longer interact with. So we have to rely on fewer antibodies to gum up spike CoV-2. And so this is where boosters come in. So what boosters will do is, is, is boost your antibody concentrations so that even though you have fewer antibodies that work, you have more of them and they're able to kind of make up for the fact that Omicron uh, uh, mutated around and, 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 and made these antibodies obsolete, okay? So this is really the key uh, to, I think, uh, why we need boosters. Now there are variant specific vaccines, which may or may not work, and we can get into that if we have some time, but with uh, right now uh, um, levels of SARS-CoV-2 going up in, in, in Europe and in Asia, uh, where we might get another spike or at least a mini surge, uh, I would encourage you if you haven't gotten already boosted, uh, now's, now's a good time to do so. Uh, the vaccines are relatively safe. You know, we've all gone through the, the, the people who have taken this, pain, redness, swelling, headaches, um, you know, kind of like getting a, 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 the flu. There are rare um, uh, side effects. Most of them are treatable, uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the, what the odds are, right? There's anaphylaxis, which again is very treatable, about five in a million. Uh, some of the uh, uh, adenovirus vaccines, you get that you've heard of the clotting disease, about three in a million. Uh, Guillain-Barre and, and, and myocarditis, which is usually uh, in, in young adolescent males at a 10 in a million. And just to, uh, and then boosters have similar effects, but just to kind of give you perspective, here's some odd ratios for kind of things that uh, we either do all the time or uh, are rare. And, 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 and it tells you uh, really what the risk benefit is, right? So the risk of, of getting a, a rare side effect really um, uh, is, is extremely outweighed by, by the benefit of, of, of not ending up in the hospital uh, with, uh, with, with SARS-CoV-2. So where do we go from here? Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of us look back uh, to 1918 and the influenza pandemic. Uh, and uh, there were uh, four major waves uh, in influenza. So we're in num number five right now, but, you know, they didn't have airplanes then. And, you know, we weren't as, as, as kind of interwoven. So, you know, this is not necessarily cause for alarm or think, okay, this thing, you know, we're going to have uh, 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 this forever, right? Um, you know, did, uh, but I think what you want to do is look back and say, okay, well, what, what, how did this, how do we get past this? Um, where we started in 1918 in the spring and we ended in uh, winter of uh, 1920. And so what happened to, to, to influenza in the 1918 strain was it actually never went away. Right, it, it settled into endemicity and seasonality. Right, and it's and 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 this had nothing to do with vaccines. Vaccines uh, against flu were not available until the 1930s. Okay, so it stayed in the population uh, until the late 50s. Okay, but influenza reinvents itself. Right, and so every time influenza reinvents itself, there is uh, a, a potential for another pandemic. Sometimes um, it's a major pandemic like 1918, 
uh, 57, but you can all remember uh, back to 2009 uh, where uh, the swine flu uh, emerged. Uh, fortunately, it was not as, as lethal as we suspected. And in 77, we actually got uh, um, a, a, a new, uh, what we thought would have been a pandemic strain, but uh, really re didn't uh, 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 amount to anything. Uh, but, you know, these, these viruses continue to stay with us. And when you get a flu shot now, it's really based on the 68 H3N2 and the 2009 uh, uh, H1N1, right? There's slight variations of them, but these things don't go away, okay? So, uh, we have to learn to live with the, the virus and the virus is learning to live with us, right? And so this is kind of uh, where I get uh, what, what, what my predictions are. Again, this is the famous Yoga Vera saying uh, about the future, but Omicron is a highly transmissible and, and, and what appears to be a less pathogenic virus, especially to vaccinated people. Uh, you know, when, when the ancestral saying jumped from a wild animal species to humans, uh, it had never been in a human before, right? It wasn't, it hadn't been adapted to humans, but these subsequent uh, uh, variants are learning to adapt to humans, right? It's not to the virus's advantage to make us really sick or kill us, right? All it wants to do is, is, is essentially go viral, right? To transmit to as many people as possible. And so Omicron uh, really represents a, a virus that is adapted to that, uh, to that space. So uh, my prediction is that it will become uh, an enduring strain or sub sub variant of Omicron uh, that, that uh, goes endemic or seasonal. There is an outside chance, obviously, that a more transmissible variant uh, will emerge that has the, a better ability to evade our vaccines and, and pre-existing immunity. Uh, but we, I see this as a low likelihood because it still needs to do its thing and unlock the the, the door to get into the cell. So doing all of these things is a really high bar. And, and I think Omicron uh, really was, was a series of, 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 of mutations that um, uh, uh, re really have, for, from the virus's perspective, how the planets align. Having that, again, again, I, I feel that it, that's a likely a low probability, but I would also anticipate that annual or biannual vaccines um, to continue to strengthen global immunity. The virus is gonna drift, virus is gonna change, but uh, I don't think that we're going to start seeing the pattern of surges uh, that we have seen in the past, okay? So where are we going from here? Um, and so I wanted to show you this graphic because everyone says, okay, this is a once in a hundred year event, okay? But what you can see here is that pandemics and especially viral driven pandemics and their occurrence in the human population has been highly compressed in the, in the 20th and in the, in the, in the 21st century, right? In our lifetimes, we can all remember HIV, the original SARS, MERS, swine flu, Zika, Ebola, and, and of course, COVID-19, right? So this is no longer a once in a hundred year event. And I don't, it would be foolish for us to kind of just say, okay, well, glad we got past that. Let's, you know, let's put everything off until the next century. Okay, now why is this happening? Um, so, so to understand this, we have to understand that you know, viruses don't come from nowhere. They come from a reservoir species. So in the case of SARS-CoV-2, a bat, and then likely through an intermediate species. In this case, people suspect the pangolin. Um, viruses jump from, from humans to, to other domesticated animals or animals we have close contact with. So this is one of the reasons that we will never eradicate SARS-CoV-2. Even if we vaccinated everybody in the world, um, it's going to be carried on by cats, hamsters, other species. So why is this more likely now than it was 100 or 200 years ago? There are a number of different reasons. Climate change, right? So some of these viruses are being carried by um, mosquitoes, okay? And so the, the, the footprint of where these, these reservoir species or these transmission species live are changing and expanding. So for example, Aedes aegypti, which carries Zika and, and, and dengue now, uh, we're starting to see more and more of that in San Diego, okay? Um, again, because our climate's getting warmer, the, uh, the, these virus carrying vectors or, or, or species are, are, are moving into those spaces. Uh, habitat encroachment and wild animal trade. Again, this is kind of that interface between the reservoir and, and humans. And of course, global interconnectivity, world travel has never been 
as accessible as it, as, 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 as it is now. And so once a virus jumps species, it can spread like wildfire, uh, really uncontained and unmitigated. And so what should we be looking out for? Okay, um, the respiratory viruses are still top on our list and novel flu and novel corona, right? Uh, Nipah, monkeypox, uh, enterovirus, which more likely would cause an ep epidemic as we saw a couple of years ago. Second on our list are, are these hemorrhagic fever viruses that are usually transmitted by bodily fluids in close contact, uh, vector-borne viruses, Zika, dengue, and so on. And then there's the dreaded disease X, uh, which is uh, predicted uh, to emerge by the WHO. And, and, and this, is a, this is a virus or a pathogen that we're no longer tracking. So what can we do? Uh, surveillance, uh, coordinated response strategies globally. Uh, we've balkanized this response and we can no longer afford to do that. Uh, Pre-positioning of antivirals and vaccines in a broad spectrum. So not just by antivirals and vaccines that work for one virus, but many different viruses. Jamie was mentioning this previously. Uh, increasing scientific literacy. So uh, science can only go so far, but if people are not willing to listen and take the medications and vaccines that can help stem the pandemic, then uh, all of this could, could be for naught. And having a pandemic preparedness program to make sure that both lives and livelihoods are protected. So here at Scripps, uh, uh, me and my colleagues are really in the forefront of, of doing a lot of these things. Um, and, and I think you'll hear a lot of talks in this series uh, on, on the different approaches that we're, we're all taking. Um, and I'm proud to announce uh, the formation of the Center, Vi Center for Antiviral Medicines and Pandemic Preparedness that's being led by Scripps um, to, 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 to really uh, uh, be a leader in these efforts. And so I would be really remiss uh, without um, uh, uh, acknowledging uh, our funders, uh, the people who allowed us to do this work, both set up the infrastructure uh, previously through uh, DOD funding, NIH funding, foundation funding from Bill and Melinda Gates, also providing supplemental uh, funds to be able, obviously none of us had funds to work on uh, SARS-CoV-2, so these agencies were very quick to get us uh, funds. But the lifeline that really enabled us to bridge this was uh, philanthropy. Um, and so Dinah Roosh uh, gave our lab a, a major donation that really allowed us to continue to do this work and Laura, um, uh, who, who I mentioned before, did a lot of this important work, uh, was a, a Fishman Fund fellow. So uh, if you are interested, uh, reach out to Scripps uh, Research Philanthropy, Meredith Johnson there. Um, and, and if you are able to help out or, or otherwise, I think the other thing you can do is call up your congressman or woman or senator and say, hey, listen, um, the NIH really needs more funding for this. There's a $16.9 billion uh, COVID relief bill that's right now being uh, really languishing in, in Congress. And uh, again, this is money. This is no time to take our foot off the gas. And uh, we need folks like you to really advocate uh, for us to be able to do our work. So I'm just going to uh, wrap things up and, and leave you with, I think, uh, the, the prediction that you know, we're, we're going to have future pandemics, but also we can be better prepared. And it's up to all of us uh, to, 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 to make sure that we are the next time. So thanks for your attention. I uh, want to uh, uh, just highlight some upcoming lectures on the Front Row series. And Jamie, I think uh, we can pivot to questions now. Terrific. Thank, thanks a lot, Sumit. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, really, you know, really interesting story about the early days of response to COVID-19 and uh, the current situation and a forward look. It was uh, terrific. And there's, there's a lot of great questions. Um, you know, but I'd, I'd like to kind of hone in on something that you said. You kind of said it in passing, but I think it's really important to emphasize for the general public. Uh, you said none of us are protected until all of us are protected. And, and you know, it really strikes me how we, we tend to you know, react very locally, but we're not thinking globally about some of these problems. And, you know, I think one of the great things that you've been doing is trying to come up with low cost medicines that can be deployed globally. So maybe, maybe could you just say a little bit more about 
Yeah, and, and I think you know Omicron is 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 a great example of that, right? So this came out of South Africa, uh, so, not not necessarily South Africa, but Sub-Saharan Africa, where the vaccination rates are low, right? And that really uh, gives a nice uh, uh, um, uh, petri dish for the the virus to evolve and grow. And of course, it doesn't stay in South Africa, right? It, it, it goes to Europe, it goes to Asia, and then it comes here. You know, right now. 45% of Americans have been touched by Omicron, right? Um, and until we get the world vaccinated, right? And, 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 and this also, you know, the economic impact, right? Supply chains, people are good. If we can provide medicines, right? There where people then can go to work, right? Those supply chains affect all of us, right? I mean, we're, we're, we have this inflation, we all know about the gas prices, um, but, you know, uh, being able to, uh, get this out to the world really saves lives and livelihoods uh, for all of us. So th there was a there's quite a few questions about the first part of the drug screening, and I, I think there was generally people were pretty interested in you know repurposing drugs. And so one that you didn't mention was ivermectin. Uh, yes. it, presumably that was in your panel. Of it's in it's in the reframe. Yes. Library. And, and yes, so it, it did not come out. up. And yeah, so so the, the thing with ivermectin is that uh, you know when when you the, the doses of ivermectin you need to see any kind of antiviral efficacy is 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 far outside the range of what you can safely deliver uh, to people. So this is this is not a drug um, that uh, you know it, it, and it, it's the same with hydroxychloroquine, right? I mean, we we looked at both, and the hydroxychloroquine came up in our in our assays. Um, but, you know, we, you have to have that filter where, you know, yes, it works in a dish, right? But if you give it at concentrations that are essentially poisonous to a human being, um, you know, the, the, the cure is, is worse than the disease in many cases, right? Yep. So, so no, here's another kind of question. So, so there was questions about the effectiveness of the drugs on variants. Now, but... So it's my understanding most of the variants are really primarily in the spike protein. Right. And, and so, it's the, the virus's response to the immune system. So do yeah. the drugs that you look for work well on the variants that emerge? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so the drugs that we look for, uh, other than the antibodies, right? So the antibodies work in the same way as the vaccines do. And there's, there's a selective pressure for the virus to evolve, okay? But because these drugs have not been widely available, right? Uh, right now, there is no resistance uh, that to those drugs. Um, but we will get resistance. We know this for a fact, right? Um, and so the optimal strategy here is to combinatorialize them, preferably with ones that have synergy like uh, remdesivir and clofazamine. But finding those right combinations is important, right? And it may or may not be clofazamine or some of these other drugs, but that's how we get out of that, right? We will get a Pfizer variant at one point, right? Unless we quickly combinatorialize these drugs. Yeah. Say, um, so, what, so what do you know about the mechanism of action of clofamazine? You know the so, target? Uh, yeah, so uh, the primary target is uh, what's called the helicase. So what the helicase does, it's part of the, the machinery that helps SARS-CoV-2 replicate. It unwinds the viral RNA so that the polymerase can kind of slide along the RNA so you can get more copies, so it can make copies of itself. And, and so this is something that, you know, we're also trying to use clofazamine as a, to build a, a better clofazamine that is a directed helicase inhibitor. Yeah, so you, you touched on this point about uh, combination therapies and, uh, you know, so I think the heart therapy for HIV has a protease inhibitor, uh, a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, and an integrase inhibitor. So, right. so those are the, what are the parts of of COVID, and and do you have drugs that hit the different parts? Yeah. So, so right now we have uh, two major targets for COVID. Right. One is the polymerase. So this is the enzyme that helps make the, the virus make copies of itself. And the other is a protease, so it's called the MPRO. And what that is ne no, needed for is that initially 
um, SARS-CoV-2, when it makes a protein, it makes what's called a polyprotein. So they're, they're uh, essentially proteins embedded in a long protein. And what the protease does is come chop them up and makes them into individual proteins so they can function in their, in their, in their individual capacity. And if the virus can't do that, um, the virus can't do all sorts of things. So, so those are the two targets right now. Um, and, and we do need more targets, right? And there are a couple of other low hanging fruits, um, but one of our goals is to really go after every single tractable target in SARS-CoV-2 um, so that we have multiple shots in that. Because, you know, again, when we started with HIV, right? It was first the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, right? And then, yeah. then we got the protease inhibitors, then we got the, the, the polymerase, uh, the, the uh, integrase inhibitors. Now we have capsid inhibitors, right? And so, you know, we don't know what the optimal combination is going to be, right? The goal is to corner the virus into a landscape where it can escape. And you don't know a priori. So the more shots on have you, more shots on net you have, the more chances that you can develop a combinatorial strategy from which the virus can escape. You know, I, I think that would be a good point for me to just mention. I can, I can uh, toot your horn a little bit, assume it. Uh, was the lead investigator on a recent application to the NIH to a program that they released for essentially pandemic preparedness. And my understanding is your application scored very well and we have no funding yet, but, but this is a huge- yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers, fingers crossed. crossed. And uh, you know, really impressive effort on your part to, to you know, uh, continue this work with federally funded uh, program. Uh, it's a multi-institutional Grant, but it, it this it, it's it's set up to do exactly what you just described is target everything, and then make yeah, sure that and, we're better prepared. And, and, and I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues on scripts at scripts and, and, and caliber. Really, a team effort here, right? It's going to take it's going to take a village to do this. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so you briefly mentioned that ACE two is the receptor for the spike protein. And a couple of people have pointed out that there are known ACE2 inhibitors. And, and it's my understanding there for you know, high blood pressure or, or you know, maybe uh, or heart failure. So, so does, do ACE2 inhibitors block viral entry? And is so there any synergy there? Unfortunately, they don't. So the mechanism for the ACE2 inhibitors actually, so the virus just uses it as a dock yeah. and it doesn't, doesn't care about the function of ACE2. And so the ACE2 inhibitors work to block its function, but what you want is to essentially gum up that keyhole, right? So it doesn't rely on ACE2 as, as you know, what the functionality of ACE2 is, but you just use it to latch on as, as a way to enter the cell. So the ACE2 inhibitors don't appear to, to provide a lot of advantage as, as an antiviral therapy. Yeah. So this here's this is I think this is an important general question. So I'll just read it. Why don't antivirals established against other viruses work here? And and so so that's a really that's a really profound question. But and yeah, and it really and kind of it, it, it your answer will show the difficulty of what we face. Yeah. So so I mean the answer is that um, they do and they don't. Right. So all of the drugs that um, we see approved right now started off as antivirals versus other drugs. So for example, remdesivir was an Ebola drug, okay? But, but because viruses are so different from each other, right? They, um, they carry different payloads, right? So um, they really have, uh, you have to start to um, uh, develop bespoke therapies for viruses. Now, can you start going after broad spectrum, right? So vi this idea that can we go away from this one bug, one drug paradigm that we've, that we've really settled into for antivirals? Yes, um, but that's much harder, right? And requires a lot of dedication and commitment. It's not impossible, but you know, it is a moonshot, right? And I think that at this point, right, we should be ready to do a moonshot, right? And, and so I think, uh, again, that is the holy grail, but because viruses are so divergent from each other, it's, 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 it's hard to repurpose things right out of the gate, but they are close enough to each other where we can think of broad spectrum strategies if we want to. But, you know, we, we start playing whack-a-mole with the viruses instead of stepping back and saying, 
hey, you know, let's let's develop a comprehensive strategy to fight more than one virus and also viruses that you know may come out in the future, right? Viruses don't come out of nowhere, right? They all evolve from each other. And so I think that this is, again, this is one of the things that we're trying to do in this new center that you mentioned, Jamie. But I think that, you know, we need a concerted effort, right? This was really probably not as bad as it could have been, however horrible it was. And this should be our wake up call to really start thinking uh, in this direction. Okay, uh, Sumit, I think, I think we need to wrap it up. There's a, there's a lot of questions. And for those of you who didn't get your questions answered, uh, we will have the opportunity for Sumit to reply offline. We've accumulated a transcript and, and we'll, we'll try to get back to you on, on some of these questions. But one thing I'd like to lift up, there's a lot of people who uh, really picked up on your, um, you know, your sentiment that we need to be better at communicating with the public. And, and science literacy. And so there's, there are many different people touched on, on this aspect and, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I would just say, this is a, a great forum for us to try to do exactly that. So thank you for, for uh, making a, a terrific, uh, a very complicated subject, very uh, accessible to the general public. And, and I, I'd like to just close by asking you a, a question. And that is, so how did you get into science? What, you know, where, where did Sumit come from and, and how did you turn into, you know, a, a, a leading virologist uh, with, with fighting, fighting with uh, therapeutics? Yeah, so, you know, my, my parents were both PhDs in, in biochemistry and the one piece of advice they had to me, for me was to not go into science. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I decided to do um, an internship um, over the summer in a lab. And I, you know, I just fell in love, right? I, I couldn't, I, 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 I didn't look back. And, and then, uh, you know, I did another internship at the Salk Institute where, um, you know, I was introduced to, to viruses and, and, um, and, and particularly retroviruses. So HIV really was my, my, my first love and then uh, kind of uh, expanded into, into uh, other areas, uh, including uh, flu and, and COVID. So that, that's really my, my progression, right? I think it was a f somewhat form of teenage rebellion, uh, just turned into something that uh, really, you know, I, 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 I can't do without, just so lucky to be able to do this for a living and, and uh, you know, and try to impact human health. Well, that was the best advice you never took. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so l listen, thanks a lot, Sumit. Um, you know, Congratulations on a terrific program and thanks for addressing our audience. And I would just like to remind you that uh, our next front row is April 20th and that's Jay Pandit, who's gonna be uh, talking about digital medicine. So again, thanks for joining us at the front row and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks.